So Peter, may I just like say a couple of words? Please, please do, yes. <laughs> so first of all, thank you for um, giving the keynote speech today. And for everyone joining us, thank you for coming here. And I'm pressing admit, admit, admit. So there are several people coming in as I speak. Uh, I, I, I had a meeting with Peter yesterday where we, uh, we just uh, did a bit of a check of how technology works. And we were a bit afraid that uh, maybe this is going to be, or this would be a long day and you know, people would be bored. But, but when I see that there are so many people coming back and they're still coming, uh, I think that everybody who's here shares the same feeling that I have, that this has been, this day passed so quickly and all the presentations were amazing and everything was on time and uh, I mean, it was just amazing. And I'm so happy that we had so many good presentations, like excellent presentations. Um, so yeah, thank you for, uh, for speaking today and thank you for being here. Now about Peter, I don't, I don't think there is anyone in this room who doesn't know Peter. And I think that most of you, if not all of you, will have worked in some capacity with Peter, <laughs> either as a student or as a colleague, as a member of staff. Um, and we all know who Peter is. Now Peter, I think that every time he introduces himself in every lecture, he doesn't forget to say that he's an artist as well. But I think that he's not insisting on this thing quite a lot or as much as he could insist. Uh, Peter is an artist as well, and I've seen some of his work and it's incredible, incredible work. I've seen some conceptual pieces that he's made. I think he showed them a year or so ago. Um, and perhaps the, the thing that some of you, pro probably many of you will not know is that Peter has just started a PhD recently. So we thought of um, inviting uh, Peter to give the keynote speech because he's in a very good position to talk about um, the connections between being a practitioner, uh, an artist practitioner, but being an academic as well uh, with a certain practice, but also just embarking on a new PhD, uh, so a new postgraduate research route. So we invited him to, uh, to talk about this and share some thoughts. So I'll just um, um, hand it over to Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, um, first of all, I need to make sure I share the right screen and put my sound on. Can you see that? Okay. Um, can you see, I'm hoping that you can see two heads of a, a, a slightly strange faced man. Yes, you can. That's great. Okay. So, um, um, well, I'm not, quite sure how to follow that um, very generous introduction from Vlad. It's very, very nice of you to say all those nice things. But um, I guess perhaps the first thing to, for, for me to say is well done to everybody, to all the students in particular, because today's been amazing, really amazing. Um, well done for studying so hard for three years, for, for, for the final few months of those three years have been so weird in lockdown and for achieving such a remarkable focus on your research and for delivering so well today. I mean, really very professionally and really, I'm slightly, um, well, more than slightly worried that I'm not gonna be able to match that level of professional practice. It's really, really good. Um, now you've done all this with great style and um, you've convinced the university that you can select topics and you can ask uh, research questions that are relevant and important. You can find material and um, you can negotiate those weird and um, frustrating conventions that we impose on you a lot of the time and that you've got the courage to do all this in your own way and with your own language and um, so I'm really I've been very inspired um, certainly today but actually for the last few years working with you too you're, you're a um, remarkable bunch of people and um, this kind of brings me to why I've included this person here. This is um, Paolo Ferreira, who um, is, um, he was a, a South American educationalist, a sort of activist. Um, and in the 1970s, he wrote this book, um, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And in it, he, he talks about a special kind of education, a special kind of learning. And there's a quote that I'd like to um, focus on for a minute. So he talks about the teacher is no longer merely the one who teaches, but who is himself taught in dialogue with the students. 
who in turn, while being taught, also teach. They become jointly responsible for a process in which all grow. And um, I feel certainly that I have grown a lot today and um, it feels that collectively we've all grown too. You've done such, such great work. One of the things that's particularly difficult to do, I think, in the kind of um, work that you've been doing is um, linking up and, and facilitating a kind of discussion in a way between quite distinct ways of thinking. And so you've been doing research, uh, you've been doing your own creative practice and you've been doing writing and these things are in, the, in, in themselves, they're quite different from each other, but they're also, um, you've kind of not in a way allowed the differences to get in the way, but you've done what Julia Kristeva calls, you've created a kind of enriching dialectic of interdisciplinarity. And I put that in there partly because there are so many syllables in it, but also partly because it's true that you've kind of, um, it's quite uh, remarkable, this, this sort of um, the way that you've um, facilitated that. And it's, it's really clear in the research that you've presented today. So um, a few days ago, then I was asked to do something a bit similar in, in that I was asked by um, these guys here to tell you a little bit about the research I've been doing. So um, I thought I would start by showing you something um, because it's kind of evidence of uh, the fact that I'm kind of trying to do the same interdisciplinary dance that you've achieved. Um, so this is um, a, um, this is me and my son. Uh, we're constructing a, um, a large silhouette of a horse and a rider. It's a life-sized silhouette. And um, basically it was a, it's an attempt on my part to kind of see what would happen if I took an element out of a painting that I was I'm researching at the moment and I insert it in a landscape. I wanted to see what, what would happen if I did that. And um, aside from um, enjoying myself and um, uh, doing something that kind of um, surprised me, it, it actually helped me to understand the painting from which the, um, this element came in the first place. Um, so I kind of, in making my art practice, I kind of, um, in a way that 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 was a form of reading of the of the artwork I was looking at so i'm I'm engaged in this um, interdisciplinary work in a way that you have been, but this is the painting that I'm talking about that there's one of the focuses of my um, research it's a painting that is uh, it's a family heirloom and it's quite a difficult one for me um, it's quite a problematic one. It was painted in 1938 by um, Oskar Jank, and it's called Der Melderreiter, which in German translates into to mean the messenger or the dispatch rider. And you can see that it's, it's a German soldier. And in 1938, German soldiers were, um, what, what can you say? They were not, they were quite a menacing presence um, to become even more menacing shortly after that. So the, the focuses of my PhD, I've got three of them really. I've got this painting, I've got art practice or my art practice in particular, and I've got the idea of the essay and perhaps the last one, you're maybe not that surprised given what you know about me, that, um, uh, that I'm looking at that. Um, now each, each kind of step I take in with each of these individual focuses, I, I kind of learn more and then I return to the other focuses and I kind of take them on in a slightly different way. So I'm finding that bouncing between the three very very rewarding and I but I also kind of come up with new problems that I have to solve let me take you through kind of a bit of a bit of what I want to say about each of these different items these focuses first of all the painting so it was painted as I said by this man Oscar Yank and it was a um, a copy of one by his older brother who was quite a well-known painter at the time um, when Oscar died um, the painting passed to his son Carl who was um, quite a high-ranking officer in the German army during the Second World War. And when he died, um, his daughter, Crystal, took it on, who happens to be my mum. And when she died, um, the painting came to me. And so I'm very fond of the painting because it kind of stands for all these people that I love, or at least I, I knew the last two, Crystal and Carl, but I didn't know the other two. And I love them and they're very important to me. And yet the painting is a kind of, um, it's a problem. It's not an easy, it's, it's a politically weird thing. Um, 
when I started looking at the painting, I was told by the family that nobody had seen this original painting that Angelo had, had painted. So I made my first task to try and track that down. And in, in looking for it, I found these um, several images that, that are very similar to the one in the Melder Writer painting I have that suggests that it's a kind of motif that um, um, Oscar was very fond of, was very interested, sorry, that Angelo was very interested in. Then I made a more disturbing discovery that the, the original painting, and here it is in situ in an exhibition, just there, you can hardly see it, I suspect. Um, this is a big annual exhibition, a bit like the summer exhibition at the Royal Academy, that um, was an open exhibition that people could submit work to, but it was basically all about, um, it was set up by the Nazi ruling party, and it was basically to um, generate a whole load of German art that could then be shipped out to different parts of the kind of growing German empire in inverted commas. And uh, more disturbingly um, of all, I found that this particular painting, the original one, so not the one that I've got, but the one, the original painting by Angelo Jank was bought by Adolf Hitler, which really disturbed me and made me very, I mean, it makes me kind of nervous talking about it now, actually, because it's it, suddenly the painting became something quite other than what I had thought it was. I mean, I thought it was just a, you know, something that I'd had in my house, but suddenly it becomes something else. And it kind of puts me in mind of the current um, kind of iconoclastic moment that we're in at the moment where um, uh, long established um, icons or, or images and objects are being challenged and smashed and being pulled down and being um, argued about. So this is an example of that. This is the uh, um, statue of Theodore Roosevelt outside the American Museum of Natural History, which has recently, they've recently agreed to take that down. And um, it also, um, the, the, the way that the painting, the, the Melder writer painting is painted, is it's in a style that was very popular at the time. It's kind of, this is a poster, a Nazi poster from 1942, that looks very wholesome and very nice with family smiling and all these sort of lovely things happening in it. But, um, it's actually a sign of fascism and um, recently I was disturbed to note that this image has been kind of repeated in murals around um, on, on walls in this is one in northern Germany in 2015 and it looks very benign and it kind of follows a, um, a normal a, a folk tradition in Germany to kind of paint things on the outside of houses but this is not a benign image this is a very um, dangerous one and um, basically it's leaving me feeling uncertain what to do with my painting because I hadn't realized that what I was taking on was so politically loaded. So basically I'm in a bit of a pickle at the moment. So enough about that, um, let's look at another focus of my research, the, the other part, so one of the other parts is the essay. Now I know, we all know what essays are, if we look at the essays that, we're, that we get set at school and university there, things that are set by teachers, they're about being graded, they're about sort of measuring progress with knowledge and ability to com communicate, they're about they've got kind of structures and language and systems that that we all need to follow. But that's only one side of the story. This is the kind of academic essay if you like, but there are all, all sorts of other sorts of essays. There's a, a more literary essay which was um, kind of developed, if, if you like, invented by Michel de Montaigne in the 16th century, so that's a long time ago, before Shakespeare. Um, and it was based on this idea of trying or attempting to um, look at things in a, in a kind of an honest way that kind of acknowledges your limitations and um, focuses on kind of your own development, if you like, as, an, as a person who's looking at things. And this has got a long tradition. There's, there's loads of different types of essays. There are even in this encyclopedia I looked at, there are 23 types of texts that are not essays, but they're confused with essays because they're so similar to essays. So this idea of essays is very big. And that's just in the textual sort of area. There is an increasing um, array of non-textual essays as well, like film, essay films and performance essays, which are really exciting. And um, this, in fact, is a still from um, uh, an essay film by Chris Marker that was mentioned in one of the presentations just recently by, by Luke, Sans Soleil or Without Sun or Sunless by Chris Marker. Um, and um, this, I think, 
chimes rather nicely with what Michael Hamburger says an essay should be. It's a walk or an excursion, not a business trip. So it's something that is um, for your own purposes and something that develops and explores things that you're not being told to do, but you're, being, uh, you're doing for your own purposes. And these other quotes here, I think, are all very important about the kind of practices and attitudes that an essay can, um, if you like, facilitate. It's about acknowledging your limitations and learning and building new things out of yourself. Now, while school and university have a lot of, um, um, they use essays a lot for kind of uh, learning purposes, and this is really important, but I think a lot of the time, um, the potential for self-expression and self-discovery is a bit overwhelmed by the conventions that are applied to essays. So perhaps there's room for a change. Now, let's talk a bit about artworks. So I've, I've shown you one piece that I did, and another one is called Meldimation, which I think some of you may have seen before. It's a short um, stop motion animation film that I did um, at the beginning of my process. And it's um, something which um, took me a long time to do. And surprisingly, I'd never made animations before. Um, and I made it out of 24 little silhouettes cut out of paper. And um, it required a kind of obsessive, repetitive process, which I'm sure all the animators in the audience are nodding and thinking, oh yes, I know all about that. I didn't know about that. And it put a lot of kind of stress and strain on my body. And I hadn't expected to suffer so much for my art. Um, it was a journey for me. And literally it was a journey in that it kind of, I took these little 24 pieces with me on to places I went to. And my intention for it was that it was a, to focus on a kind of motif of movement from space. And when I look at it now, I, I feel that it's slightly unsatisfactory in terms of how it deals with the issues that I'm talking about in, um, you know, the political issues that I talked about. So I don't, I don't know where to take it now, but I'm going to pursue it. Another piece, this is the, the last piece I'll, I'll talk about very briefly, is uh, this one, it's Melder writer Charcoal Fan. And um, it was another piece in which I was trying to um, create a kind of life-sized version of the painting because it's a life-sized issue for me um, but in this one I wanted to um, actually insert myself into it so I um, did this large charcoal drawing on the studio on the wall of my studio and then um, did a drawing of my head and pinned it on top of the um, the horse on top of the rider and I actually, I mean, I'm not terribly intelligent, I think, because I hadn't realised that in doing that, what I was doing was I would be covering up perhaps the most contentious bit of the image, which is the, the Stahlhelm or the, or the German soldier's helmet, because without that, the image just looks like anyone on a horse. And I think I'm also not terribly intelligent because I hadn't realised just how, um, I don't know, how much of an impact just doing that simple thing would have on me. and. Um, Basically what happens in this, I'm gonna to have to move through it more quickly, is that over time with the fan running like that, um, and I introduced the fan because I wanted to experiment with chance, um, the image below kind of deteriorates and disappears slightly. And um, I end up with a kind of, I don't know, I suppose the whole thing is a bit of a metaphor, I suppose, for my struggles with this um, problematic iconography of the painting, um, because, try as I might in a way to, to, to remove the kind of offending bit of the image I can't get rid of it it's always there so I have to deal with it and um, yeah watch this space I don't know how to deal with it and what to do next right I'm sorry I've run over time but uh, basically that's all I wanted to say about my work um, and um, I suppose I just want to return finally to Freira to say congratulations to you all again for such wonderful um, talks and such amazing hard work that you've done. Um, and I guess finally, I just wanted to say thank you so much to the Contextual Studies, Visual, Spatial, Cultures team. First, perhaps for, for inviting me to speak, but also for organising such a, a great day, a really thrilling day. Um, you know, we had no Glastonbury this year or no Wimbledon, but we do have transformations too. So a very big and heartfelt thank you very much. I'll stop there. Oh my God, Peter, thank you very much. This, this was 
this was mind blowing. Like, honestly, you're doing amazing stuff. And I've, I've actually, I mean, I have loads of questions and probably there will be questions from, from the audience as well. Uh, can I, can I just like take this opportunity and ask a question first? <laughs> I'm really curious about it. Um, so what I, I found it really interesting that you play with this. So basically you take the, the, the shape or the, the, the figure of, 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 of the rider and the horse and you go with it on the field. And I think that by doing that, you kind of transform the painting in a sort of a monument. <laughs> um, which, which in my mind is quite provocative and especially within, like, within this context when, mm. when like, people talk so much about monuments and talking uh, about, you know, like, you know, where we, we should actually have monuments at all and what sort mm. of monuments should we have. And, and how does it, I don't know, I mean, I don't know if you agree with me, but um, yeah, I, I, I mean, like, how does it make you feel when, when, when you actually take a piece of this painting, which has such a troubled, problematic context? And when you take it to, like, you know, like public spaces and then, or maybe private spaces, but then, you know, you do a little bit of work around it and you show it. How does it make you feel? I'm just curious in terms of how you negotiate with this troubled past. Well, um, I must, add, I have to admit that I'm... Um... I don't, I don't think I'm the most intelligent artist actually, because the way that the, it really didn't occur to me that um, it was as problematic as it was, but I, perhaps I'm kind of slightly um, shielded or blinded by my family connection to it or something, I don't know. But um, in, in the first instance, when I did those small animations and then when I took the larger piece, um, I was thinking that it was, I was in a way kind of anonymizing it slightly and um, it was almost not possible to see that it was a German soldier. Um, and I wanted just to celebrate movement and space and crossing mm. space. And I wanted to put these, this sort of slightly jokey provocation in the landscape, but because it reminded me of the Osborne um, brandy bull that you see on the silhouettes on the, on the landscape in Spain sometimes and the, the sort of Marlborough um, billboards that you see and um, you used to see perhaps with the, the cutout horses and things like that so it reminded me of those things it was less a, less I wasn't thinking so much of it as a, as a monument but when I heard about the um, Theodore Roosevelt monument um, uh, story saga about that it was such a strong um, uh, made it so obvious that that's what I'm dealing with that I've I've um, I kind of I uh, can't quite believe that I hadn't realised that before. Um, so I'm, I am um, not turning away from it. I won't be ignoring it. I have to take it on. But I really don't know how to take it on. I don't know what to do with it. I'm, I'm thinking that I'm, what, one, one, some of the projects I'm planning to do will be collaborative ones. So I'm interested to, to work with others and for us to come um, up with uh, responses to this problematic iconography together so for, to, to take work and do it in particular places that have significance to the painting so I'm hoping maybe that's one way to do it but I, I am um, yeah did I answer your question I think I yeah, yeah. no no I think you do um, and I'm, I'm can looking... I, sorry Vlad can I just say something on that point Peter I think the the element of the essay involved in this is so perfect because exactly your expression of discomfort or your experience of discomfort your your personal growth or awareness is is absolutely fitting for that for that narrative you know the that you become a a, a paradigm or a conduit through which others can understand similar things and i think it's just it's perfect mm. thank you well it's good to know that my um <laughs> my anxiety and difficulty is um has some benefits but i i i, I yeah, I guess I, I hadn't quite realised how um, important that uh, an element of the essay that is. Um, that and and that's one of the things that frustrates me a bit about the essay in in the university and at school. That that the struggle that we have that when we write those things is almost something that we should we need to kind of hide away or something. It's almost not acknowledged in a way because. Um, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it is acknowledged, we all know it happens, but, but um, I think as a, as a student writing an essay, I, I certainly felt like I was just an idiot because I couldn't do it right. Mm -hmm. And um, um, yeah, I had nice teachers and everything, but I, I still felt like an idiot.
Um, I'm keeping an eye on the group chat and there were some interesting comments um, and I'm going to read uh, some of them. And I've also unmuted you all. So if you want to ask a question, um, yeah, please use the raise hand button or, you know, like make yourself visible. Um, so there is a question from Lauren, but I just wanted to read the comments first about that, that point about uh, our monumentality. Lauren says that thinking about our monuments is so worth exploring and talking about more in this forum with our amazing students. Mm. And I agree because there were quite a few presentations thinking about monuments today. Mm. Yeah. That's a very interesting thing. And Luke says, um, so, so this idea about scale and monumentality, that's what works really well with the animation. It turns the big heroic monumental figure into something small and a little bit silly. I think this is an interesting way to deal with the imagery and its effect. Um, yeah. And Naomi says, I also think we cannot distance artworks and monuments from the context in which they are made. Um, and I think, okay, so, so Lauren has a question. Lauren, do you want to, do you want to ask? Yeah, it? sure. I mean, to be honest, Peter, it was more of a summary from, from these conversations and the, and the things that um, I think people are thinking about, but relating it to your thinking around this idea of what do you do with a troublesome object? <laughs> how do you solve a troublesome object through creative practice and research? And mm. how do you present it in a way that we can be critically engaged? And a lot of our students within the fashion department deal with that sort of every week while they're you know, with us through the three years. And um, your work made me think of a similar situation where my Austrian Jewish emigre family have ended up with a uh, the, the British fascist branch of the Nazi party run by Oswald Mosley in the 1930s mm. had a uniform, for those of you who don't know, which included a black shirt. And our family have ended up with one. And it's been in the family for three generations. And I have, in my role as family archivist, <laughs> been given it. And lots of us have these problematic objects and lots of us are dealing and researching and and thinking around these problematic objects but i was really interested to think about the way that the conversation around monuments right now and what we do with them is related to not only your work but the work of a lot of our students in tackling these quite confrontational issues mm. and instead of as you were saying peter ignoring them or putting them away, we have to face them and we have to confront them. And one of my comments in the chat bar was a lot of conversation about toppling these monuments seem to solve or resolve that issue by saying museums should be locations where we then can put them and archive these objects and then they're dealt with satisfactorily. Mm. But I'm really interested in your way of actually pulling them back out of the space of the invisible mm. and dealing with them actively and activating them in a different way and i would argue that probably a lot of sorry i am I'm, I'm rambling i'll stop no, but i'm just minded to the fact that a lot of what people who are toppling monuments are doing are also activating the objects and so that was an open question to you peter mm. but also something that i know our students will pick up on because of the way that they deal with problematic objects in their own research. I think I like, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of um, activating and um, I was reading something by uh, John Roberts uh, a little while ago about um, the copy and um, I, I, do t I think of the work that I do as copying the painting really I, I spend a lot of time just looking at the painting and doing literally just copying it in a quite a literal way. But I think those pieces in a way are copies um, in the sense that they are um, reversioning them or remaking them and um, trying to sort of um, in a way acknowledge a sort of uh, a, a lineage or something, trying to kind of create a bit of a, a line rather than having everything stop with that image, which is in a way, it's an image where um, it's, it's almost impossible to go beyond it. Um, it's because it's such a, so many awful things happened around it. So much, so much bad stuff is represented by it, that um, it's almost, it, it, it did occur to me that maybe I should destroy it. But then um, that's not really dealing with it, I think. I think I have to, 
take some do something with it and um mm. i mean maybe destroying it is doing something with it i don't know i mean i'm kind of talking around in circles here but the um i think activating is is a very interesting word and what i think what perhaps what we have a choice in doing as creative uh, practitioners is activating them in certain ways so we can we can emphasize elements and de-emphasize other elements and um refocus attention on them in ways that perhaps doesn't come up with answers perhaps just answers asks more questions and asks us to take them on in different ways yeah. I, think. Yeah. I think that's true one of our wonderful students just earlier in a panel said it's a it's a privilege to uh discuss the present without bringing up the past and we have to be mindful of the fact that we are not in that privileged position and we have to be bringing in the past because it it matters to the present and the future mm. yeah and actually if i maybe quote one of the excellent student presentations that i saw earlier courtney wilson was talking about black only fashion shows mm. and she was very concerned about this issue of symbolic progress versus real progress and she talked in the Q&A section about the toppling of statues, for example, of slave owners in um, cities like Bristol, etc., as, yes, a symbolic act just now, mm. but it's a necessary precursor to real progress in the future. So she yeah. said it's something that precedes actual change and it's something we should, um, we should enjoy, we should encourage mm. this symbolic act because it leads to the real change in behavior that's that's really good very interesting mm. wow i'm i'm a bit aware that uh we are a clique of lecturers asking questions to uh, <laughs> Peter, and i'm wondering whether maybe there are uh some of our graduating students who would like to um, ask a question or maybe um a commentary or or something like that um, so if there's anyone who would like to say something, please do it. <laughs> anyone has? There's something quite daunting about stepping forth and asking a question, isn't there? Okay, if not, uh, or maybe you can ask later. I mean, when somebody has a question. Um, if not, I'm also going to go through the Zoom chat. Uh, Rihanna is saying that, uh, where is it? Uh, yes, there is also a very interesting discussion about trauma and traumatic uh, yes. events. And it's, um, and, and their relationship with creative practice. Uh, and there was a discussion earlier today, which seems to be relevant here as well. Um, and Stephen, actually, um, who presented just a bit earlier in uh, the fifth panel, he says that so it's a, an interesting discussion about removing problematic objects as his family threw out some golly walk mugs they've had for several decades. Um, mm. Naomi also says that, of course, buildings themselves can be problematic objects. Um, and Luke mentions a film by Laura Mulvey and Mark Lewis about the toppling of status at the end of the Soviet mm. era. Uh, I don't know to that. I think it's called Disgraced Monuments. Um, and actually, I've just remembered something. There is a Bulgarian artist, uh, artist uh, who has a very interesting practice. He's been dealing with monuments of horse riders for the past 15 years. Really? So he travels around Europe and uh, takes images of all this, of course, uh, you know, like kings and, and you know, all this like royalties. And a lot of them were, of course, involved in very nasty business. And then he pro processes these images and sends the riders in holidays. <laughs> so <laughs> then when he publishes these images. There are images of horses alone, uh, uh, only horse. You can only see a horse on a, you know, on a, on a, on a pedestal oh, there's no rider anymore the rider disappears from the frame it's really interesting I, I i mean i can share the link if you want um so that's using humor isn't it so that's, that's taking humor. taking taking quite dangerous and difficult subject matter and subverting it and weakening it um with humor which um well i i, I like i think i like that idea it's nice um 
I'm not sure if I can do it actually, but I, I, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> okay. Um, can Can I ask Peter if you um and you may not be at a stage where you're re really sort of ready to say what what you plan to do, but how do you see and for the for any students who might possibly at some point be interested in doing further research or a PhD a practice based PhD, if you could maybe say something about um how you envision or how you maybe envisioned when you first started out before you before you were thrown for a bit of a loop um this kind of manifesting as as a bit of writing or as a and also as a film or as images or how you know how did you hmm. how are you conceiving of this as a sort of final um pro product or project that's a um a really it's a great question and i i i um I had a, my starting point was um, I kind of undenied about whether to do this for a long time, and um, I couldn't quite work out what I was going to look at. Um, but then I realised that there were I, I could find um, uh, kind of intersecting interests, which I think is something I must have spoken to some of some of the students about in terms of finding a focus on the research. And I thought, well, if I find if I if I base myself in areas of uh, research that I'm interested in, I'll, 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 I'll have a good time at least, and I'll, I'll find interesting things, and I'll, um, so that was one thing, I had a kind of blind faith, I suppose, that something interesting would turn up. Um, also, I have a, 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 an art practice that's quite varied, so I'm, I'm, um, I've shown, I guess, mainly film-based stuff, but I do a lot of drawing, and um, I'm going to be making more objects a bit like that that constructed thing with the different panels because i'm um um i want to make a um what do you call it a kind of diorama of the of the of the of the space within the painting i'm interested in, in making a kind of model um of that um and so i i i guess in terms of outputs i'm I, i'm expecting there to be a, a number of different outputs and in different media and that I'll probably combine them um, and and show them separately too. Um, and I quite like that in the way that it kind of relates to an essay, in the way that we combine things in essays. We take fragments of this and fragments of that and for, you know squeeze them together and and we say, look, this is about that. But if you combine that with this in a different way, you could say it's about this other thing. And I, I mean, it, it's I don't know. I'm not sure if it'll if, if it'll really wash, but. That um, in terms of outputs, I guess that, that's one thing. But I'm in writing. I haven't really said much about writing. Um, I'll be I'll be producing a thesis as as you do in these things, but um, um, and that will be about um, the essay and about uh, the research I did. But along the way, I'm 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 writing. Um, I tend to, I keep a kind of free writing log, if you like. So so. Um, it helps me to make sense of what I'm doing and helps me to decide what to do next. Um, and I'm, I, I think one thing I need to write is, a, is, a, is basically an essay, a shortish text about this problem that I'm facing at the moment. So I guess what I'm expecting in terms of outputs, there'll be a, a range of them. Some of them would be made art, art, art work, make, made pieces of art, uh, but there'll also be pieces of writing. Um, I've just uh, got through my registration so I'm sort of in um, not right at the beginning I'm not anywhere near the end either but I've, I'm sort of I've got, I've got a kind of plan but it's taken me a while to develop it okay does anyone else have a question or maybe a point that you want to make No, okay. I'm also, uh, I mean, I'm aware of the time and we said that we would finish by um, 10 to 5 or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, maybe this is the, the moment to, uh, to finish it. Um, Peter, thank you very much for the presentation. It was really good. Amazing. Um, and I'm going to write an email shortly because I've, like, I've got some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all so much. It's been it's been fabulous. It's been really interesting. Wonderful day. Uh, 